Greetings. Um, uh, tonight we're in for such a, a, a special treat. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear what, what, what we talk about tonight. Uh, Dr. 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 Gordon Emhart is one of my heroes, and so it's my privilege to be here today. Uh, she is the author of Collective Courage, a history of African American cooperative economic thought and practice, and the 2016 inductee into the U.S. Cooperative Hall of Fame. Dr. Gordon, uh, Gordon Emhart is a professor of community justice and social economic development in the Department of African Studies at John Jay College to the University of New York. Dr. Gordon Emhart is a political economist specializing in cooperative economics, community economic development, and community-based asset building, racial wealth and equality, solidarity economics, Black political economy, and community-based approaches to justice. She is a co-editor with Nginga Shitechi of Wealth Accumulation and Communities of Color. She is a member of the Cooperative Economic Council of NCBA uh, slash CLUSA, the International Cooperative Alliance Committee on Cooperative Research, a faculty fellow and mentor with the Institute uh, for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing at Rutgers University School of Management and Labor Relations and an affiliate scholar with the Center for the Study of Cooperatives in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada. Dr. Gordon Emhart is also a past board member of the Associate Association of Cooperative Educators, a past fellow with the Center on Race and Wealth at Howard University, and a member and past president of the National Economic Association. She's a proud mother of Stefan and Susan and grandmother of Stefan Hugo, Ishmael, and Gazelle Nemhart. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gordon Nemhart. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to learn about the museum. I'm happy to be part of this program. And I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint. Uh, here we go. So I'm here to talk about African American co-op histories. And mostly, uh, I'm tr I tried to focus on co-op farming. Um, but you'll see, I'll talk a little bit um, about a variety of different co-ops in African American history. And I got to figure out which thing I'm pressing there to move things along. I also, before I start, I do want to acknowledge the original stewards of the land. Uh, I'm actually in New York City at the moment, and that would be the Lenape Nation uh, in Dayton and Ohio. It's the Shawnee. And then I think there's about four or five other nations. Hopefully you all know what land, whose land you're on or what land uh, it originated in. I also want to acknowledge our ancestors. I'd like to always bring them in the space with me, especially to remember those who are enslaved, those who continue to labor without just compensation, and also those who practice resistance. So let's not remember ourselves as victims, but as uh, activists and as actors. And to recognize the struggles of all those who continue to combat anti-Blackness, racism, patriarchy, police brutality, et cetera. Uh, acknowledging the movement for Black lives, and please let's all acknowledge our elders as well. So thank you for having me again. I want to start with a quote from Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, I don't know how to, I hope you can see the top of my slides. I don't actually know how to um, get rid of that top thing if you're seeing it, but anyway. You can um, see it. Okay, you can see the top. I have all that menu on top of mine, so I wasn't sure if you guys had it obstructed or not. Um, in a speech she gave uh, in the 1970s, she said, cooperative ownership of land opens the doors, many opportunities for group development. That's the, one of the important parts of this term, for group development of economic enterprises, which develop the total community. So that's the other piece that's so important, developing the total community rather than creating monopolies that monopolize the resources of a community. And I wanted, since we're talking about black farming, I have a beautiful picture of Fannie Lou Hamer, the farmer, right? Not just the activist. So I want, again, I'm calling her into our space here to work with us to talk about these issues. So I'm gonna 
I have a bunch of slides, a few slides on what are cooperatives. I think you all probably know what they are, but I'll go through them a little bit quickly just to just to establish to make sure. So they are member owned, member run, member serving businesses, values based, jointly owned enterprises, right? They're created actually to solve economic problems and address community needs. So they're a little bit different from for profit corporations, which are created to um, make a profit, right? So these values-based jointly owned enterprises operate according to set of principles about membership, democratic governance, equality, justice, sustainability, and caring community. According to the International Cooperative Alliance, the values of cooperatives are about self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. Right, members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. That translates into a set of seven principles, which um, uh, businesses are evaluated on in order to claim the status of a co-op. Um, you have to have open and voluntary membership. You have to have that democratic member control, one member, one vote. Remember that most for-profit corporations are one share, one vote. So you're power has to do with how much money you've invested. Whereas in a, a co-op, your power is you as a member. Every member has the same equal vote. And uh, board of directors are made from members and not outside people. Uh, members' economic participation, so not just con democratic control, but actually participating in the economics, whether you're a consumer or a producer or a worker, your um, your relationship, your economic relationship to the co-op is as important as your governance and your, your uh, democratic relationship to the co-op. So that means there's limited compensation to capital. Um, co-ops actually can be for profit, but their mission is not profit driven. Also autonomy and independence cooperatives are not supposed to be beholden to political parties or doctrines, that kind of thing. Uh, principle five, education, training, and information, right? Making sure that people know and understand, right? Their industry, how to run uh, an organization democratically so that they can make the right and the best decisions for the enterprise. Cooperation among cooperatives, work with other cooperatives and support other cooperatives as much as possible. That connects them to a community and then concern for community. So you see how these principles help this be a very mission-driven, community-driven, social purpose-driven kind of enterprise rather than just a for-profit um, investment corporation. And what does joint ownership really mean? It means you pool resources, you leverage those resources, you reduce individual risk, you profit share, and this helps us to address low-income capital flight issues, lack of experience, right, where everybody's pooling together in that democratic fashion. Finally, we know that co-ops have better longevity than traditional small businesses and corporations. Um, some data from several years ago found that after the first year, only 10% of co-ops fail, where 80% of small businesses fail. After five years, 90% of um, co-ops are still usually in operation, and only 3 to 5% of traditional businesses. So that Longevity, right, again, because of all those interlocking principles and values about how to run a business and be a business and be connected to community make a difference for longevity. We also know that cooperatives address um, and survive crises um, better than other kinds of businesses because they do, again, they're more flexible. Um, two heads are better than one. They allow everybody to weigh in to come to a good decision, right? And so the businesses. Um, survive and flourish better even under um, crises situations. So that's why um, people like myself started studying cooperatives and um, talk about them so much because of all those kinds of benefits. And then you'll see in a minute, I also summarize the benefits I found um, looking at the history of black co-op ownership. The other thing we need to know though is that co-ops are universally owned. Every population in human history in every era on every continent uh, in the world have used and continue to use cooperate, economic cooperation and own co-ops and own uh, things cooperatively. We often talk about the notion of the common good, the commonwealth, the commons, those are all ways that we own things collectively, but we also have um, land trusts and community land trusts and 
mutual aid associations, um, and other kinds of collective ownership in addition to official, officially incorporated cooperatives. So all those notions of collectivism and rotating savings and credit, susus and other kinds of forms are all what we're talking about when we're talking about collective cooperative ownership. Um, the notion from Kwanzaa about collective work and responsibility is also here, right? Um, even if people don't actually create cooperatives, they use collective work and responsibility and how that's how human beings operate. That's how we have achieved most of what we achieve. And then we know that indigenous groups from First Nations to early African civilizations, all their first methods of economics were really cooperative efforts. And so that's what I mean by universality. Everybody has used it. It's not one population's um, method. Um, and it's as old as human beings are old. So it's not a new method, even though some people are just learning about it and just getting excited about it. So when I studied African-American practices, I found that we have a long and strong history of mutual aid and cooperative ownership, especially in reaction to market failures and economic and racial discrimination. Um, so using it to survive, making sure we helped each other whenever we could to help ourselves, we needed to help each other, that kind of understanding. It was often a hidden history, one complicated by economic marginalization and thwarted by racial discrimination and white supremacist violence. And in a little bit, I'll talk about what some of that white supremacist violence against co-ops has looked like. Um, and yet still, you know, every decade in US history, we've had, um, we've had co-ops uh, in the black community so that we, the co-ops kind of represent survival, resistance, and prosperity for African Americans. That's a copy of the cover of my book. I also just recently helped um, Esther West with a study of Latinx co-ops. Now, she didn't actually do the history yet. She just kind of did a scan, a census of what Latinx co-ops are looking like in 2020. Um, but it still gives you a, a good sample of uh, what brown people are doing with co-ops. Um, and hopefully I keep encouraging people to actually do the history of Latinx co-ops too, so we really can see the parallels. So what do I cover in the book? Hundreds of mutual aid societies, black communal towns, some of which were in Ohio, um, and formal and informal economic cooperation from 1790 to around 2013. Um, I could name about 162 legally incorporated cooperative enterprises in addition to all those informal and other kinds of economic cooperation, uh, both rural and, and urban in the North, the South, Midwest, um, all through the country um, from the 1800s. And then also I refer to a book that W.E. Du Bois put together where he noted 20 black credit unions and actually 154 black co-ops by 1907. So in addition to the 162 that I was able to find, he actually, had almost the same amount you know, before the 20th century got in full swing. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. It's not a huge number and I didn't, I wasn't able to find every single black co-op, which is what I started out to do. Um, but I found great examples uh, of all different kinds of co-ops to be able to share, to show that there is this continuous legacy of African-American co-op ownership. And so why did African-Americans get involved in co-op ownership? We were searching for alternative economic solutions to address, address the fact that we were exploited. First, we didn't even own our own bodies as enslaved peoples, right? We were discriminated against, we suffered inequality. Um, and so we used those African retentions, notions that we brought, you know, that had been brought from the African continent about cooperation, self-help ideologies, a sense of voluntary segregation to create our own as much of control, create and control as much of our own economics as we could. And that led us to create actual co-ops um, in racially uh, self-sufficient ways, self-sufficiency, um, and allow us to design and manage goods and services in racially and culturally sensitive ways. And so that's the history that I was able to pull together um, from the research I did. And I, I noticed that co-op movements pretty much started with agriculture, with farming and food security issues, right? And moved rapidly into land ownership because obviously you can't farm, right? If you don't have land, right? So a lot of the early co-ops were all around land and, and food, 
right? Um, and also there was an early interest in cooperatives, not just for survival, right? Not just for food security, but also for some level of independence and self-determination. And so it's an interesting history. It's kind of an economic and political history because as we're fighting for political and civil rights, we're also fighting for economic justice, economic democracy and economic independence. And the co-ops are right there in that movement. And I also, as I went through the history, especially in the 20th century, I found that a lot of the black leaders that we know in the civil rights movement also actually were part of the co-op movement or got their start in co-ops or had something to do with co-ops. So there's that interesting integration of the political struggle and economic struggles. Um, and then we did practice cooperative and collective economics, even though it was dangerous to discuss it and pursue it. And again, in a minute, I'll talk about um, those dangers. I just wanted to say one more thing about the parallels between the Black co-op movement and the long civil rights movement. So again, from our first moments on North American soil, we resisted enslavement, oppression, we fought for our own freedom. At the same time, we were pursuing economic alternatives as part of the struggle and resistance, also partly to give us some independence to do the political struggle, but also to make sure we could survive, right? And then sometimes once we could survive, then we had the energy to do more resisting. And so there's this uh, interlocking relationship between, as I said, the pursuit for political and, and legal justice and the pursuit for economic justice. Um, and when we tell that story about um, black co-op history, we also are telling a story about civil rights activities. And when we talk about civil rights activities, um, when you look a little deeper and you see in my book, you're really also talking about some co-op and um, economic justice strategies. And so what were these visions for the cooperative alternative economies? It was a combination of sort of populism, labor organizing, civil rights and alternative economics, um, all overlapping and interlocking with each other. So we were establishing cooperatives so we could get affordable goods and services. We um, could share and lend money for land, for business ownership, for equipment. We could share the profits that we were creating jointly through these kinds of efforts. We could supply and support each other. We were establishing economic independence so we didn't need to depend, right, on white landowners or white exploiters, et cetera. And then a lot of these co-ops within the group, and you'll see I have some examples, had visions of larger regional, national, international systems of cooperation. And so they weren't just doing something uh, local, immediate, just for that small group who might be in that one co-op. They rapidly connected with other co-ops, saw connections to other struggles, and um, looked for ways to become larger and to, um, and to create interlocking systems of support. Um, at the same time, as I keep hinting at, there is a history of sabotage. Uh, the whole gamut, uh, from uh, racial discrimination and financial sabotage to white supremacist competition, violence, and actual terrorism. So some of the co-ops um, were thwarted just because uh, they didn't have enough uh, education about how to run a business, or they didn't have enough savings because they had been so racially discriminated against. They either were enslaved or didn't have a good job or whatever, or sometimes banks and uh, wouldn't lend them the money they needed to start up the business or insurance companies wouldn't uh, insure or jacked up their premiums so they couldn't afford insurance, things like that are what I mean by financial sabotage. And the competition, right, white stores competed heavily against the co-ops, but also uh, white landowners and other white supremacists actually used violence and terrorism, including lynching, burning down uh, fields, burning down co-op, buildings, that kind of thing. Um, and even in the face of all those um, efforts at sabotage, which continued into the 20th and probably a little bit in the 21st century, we still had people persisting and continuing to do uh, co-op development. And so that's partly why the book is called Collective Courage. It took courage not just to pursue an alternative economic strategy, but it also took courage to pursue cooperatives in particular because there was so much opposition to them, both ideological opposition and, as I said, this sort of physical sabotage of a variety of sorts. 
but the story is really a story of resistance and resilience and prosperity, right? And so what was accomplished through these co-ops? Resources got pooled. The pooled resources allowed groups of people to leverage what little, th what little they had as individuals, to buy together, to own together, to farm together, to bank together, all those kinds of things so they could do more together than what they could do individually. Um, these co-ops also provided quality goods and services and access to quality goods and services, again, in culturally, geographically sensitive and appropriate ways. We saved costs, we increased our income and wealth through the use of cooperatives, we were able to combat racial discrimination and exploitation. We increased Black economic stability and self-sufficiency, independence and self-determination. Um, the co-ops also helped to save and create decent jobs in communities that were more controlled by the community, especially by Blacks themselves. Um, we developed a sense of collective agency and collective action that allowed us to pursue other agency and assert ourselves in other ways, in civic society as well as in our economic ways. And co-ops actually helped us to develop leadership. Um, there's uh, growing evidence about the social capital development and the leadership development that happens when people engage in cooperative economics because of that um, joint ownership and democratic governance that co-ops have. So let's talk about history a little bit. Um, one of the other things I found was that there were many uh, African-American organizations that actually promoted economic cooperation and co promoted cooperative development. And often the most prolific periods in our history when we had the most black co-ops were coincided with periods when we had the strongest largest black organizations so the first major one i want to uh, i'll mention is the colored farmers national alliance and cooperative union um, and i'll talk a little bit about more about that in a minute there was also the ex-slave patient ex-slave pension society which was actually a mutual aid society um, and a political party a lobbying institute for back wages and pensions for ex-slaves. So it was actually the first uh, um, reparations organization, national reparations organization. We've got the UNIA with the Marcus Garvey movement. They also pursued um, something about economic cooperation, not as many co-ops, but something. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois started the Negro Cooperative Guild, which is very short lived, but he did bring a bunch of um, black leaders from around the country together to talk about cooperative economics. And many of them went home and started co-ops back in the early 1900s. There's the Colored Merchants Association, which was a co-op of uh, independent black grocers in order to stay in business with the rise of the chain supermarkets. The National Association of Colored Farmers in the 1920s and 30s. Um, making sure that farmers uh, could organize themselves and use cooperatives to help them buy land, sell their products, get the supplies they needed, that kind of thing. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. The Young Negroes Cooperative League in the 1930s, which I'll also talk about. Uh, even our first official independent Black uh, union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, their ladies auxiliary was very much involved in co-op development the Black Panther Party, right? Their whole community uh, advocacy was really based on collective economics and solidarity economics. Um, we now have, we still have from the 1960s, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund, which I'll also talk a little bit more about. The Nation of Islam has sometimes been involved in uh, creating worker co-ops and uh, uh, food co-ops. Uh, and now in the 21st century, we have groups like Green Worker Cooperatives uh, in the South Bronx, us, lift, lift, us Lifting Us in Atlanta, the Movement for Black Lives. All those groups actually are promote, talk about, promote, and advocate uh, cooperative ownership as part of our liberation struggle and part of the struggle um, to get control over our own economics. So my first example, trying to make sure I cover some specific examples. During the Civil War, uh, when Eastern South Carolina was liberated through the efforts of Harriet Tubman, I don't know if all of you know about the Cumbie River uh, expedition, but Harriet Tubman was one of the scouts uh, that uh, convinced the Union Army to go up and liberate that area. 
It was liberated. I think over 750 enslaved peoples were liberated from that um, military action. But the result of that military action was that many of the men joined the Union Army to fight against the Confederacy. The women, children, and elderly were left uh, in the abandoned, on the abandoned plantations because all the white plantation owners fled that area once it was liberated by the Union Army. And the women uh, ran those plantations, uh, made handicrafts, did farming, and they did it all as collectives and ran it as collectives. They refused to work for whites. They insisted on taking care of their own and remaining independent until the Civil War was over. So that's a very early example of, you know, liberation, independence, women's, uh, women's persistence, et cetera, from the 1860s. By the 1880s, we have the Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union, which grew out of a whole uh, movement in the 1880s to bring uh, um, labor organizing, co-op organizing, uh, women's rights groups, uh, integration, groups who believed in integration, because by the 1880s, we've got a backlash against Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow and segregation in the South and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. But we also have a rise of very progressive forces. Uh, the populist movement, black and white populist movements connecting with labor um, and the co-op movements. And the Colored Farmers Alliance is exactly that same kind of an organization, specifically for black farmers and farm workers. So a very interesting organization combining landowners and landless farm workers. They are a national um, political party arguing for the rights of the small farmer and for the renewed rights of Blacks who are now disenfranchised, et cetera, in the South and in some of the North. They also are a labor union and a, a cooperative development association. So all build into one formed to aid black farmers and farm workers to regain their rights, to be able to make a living and to um, create cooperatives, both worker cooperatives and farm cooperatives, and to counter the uh, rising violence of the Ku Klux Klan and the white supremacist landowners. Um, the best to our knowledge, there were over a million members and it was the, black, the largest black organization of its time. And someone just told me the other day that they think it was probably the largest black organization in history in the US. Um, and so it's, again, it's fascinating that that organization was not just the labor union and a political party, but actually was a co-op development organization. Um, they established cooperative stores so that people could buy their goods and supplies in bulk at reduced prices. They shared equipment. They also had what they called credit exchanges, which are um, early forms of credit unions where they could secure loans to buy mortgages or to pay off mortgages so they could buy land, uh, buy equipment, do marketing. They were often terrorized and so often operated underground. So people um, didn't promote or talk about them that much, but they kept operating because um, their members needed, uh, needed these services and needed to be able to control their own economics. They, um, they also, uh, by 1891, just before uh, the organization kind of was demolished because of all the um, terrorism against it, um, they did organize a cotton pickers league and a cotton pickers strike. Um, this was actually really to support the farm laborers, not so much the farmers, but they wanted the cotton pickers demanded higher wages. Um, they attempted a strike. Uh, it's not clear whether the strike, how far the strike succeeded, but according to the Atlanta Constitution, it was the largest agricultural strike in history at that time. It was squashed with white supremacist violence against the strikers, but again, it, it shows you that um, this, the um, Colored Farmers National Alliance and Cooperative Union were activists as well as cooperators um, and put their money where their mouth was. Um, fast forward in the 1920s, the National Association of Colored Farmers um, incorporated in Chicago a few years after it started, but had members in 12 different states, but they used Chicago as their headquarters. Their mission was to stabilize African-American land ownership, to improve farm living, 
um, to do use cooperative buying, production, and marketing to make sure that farmers and farm workers, again, could make a proper living, could control their incomes, that kind of thing. They were able to assist members in purchasing farms or securing better legal share cropping contracts so they could make a stable living from farming. Um, they also uh, really were able to pool their bulk buying, so they saved members 25 to 40 percent in costs. Right. They allowed them access to more favorable credit so they could buy equipment, buy land, et cetera. And over the first 10 years of its existence, um, most of the members who started out as sharecroppers and tenants um, were able to become farm owners. And so they had, you know, that's a major accomplishment here. Uh, 1930s, the Young Negroes Cooperative League was started by a guy named George Schuyler, who was a um, Pittsburgh Courier uh, columnist. He wrote a column calling on young Negroes to save the race by engaging in economic cooperation with Ella Jo Baker. He then founded the Young Negroes Cooperative League. They brought together 25 to 30 delegates from around the country uh, and started a headquarters in Harlem. Their goal was to form a coalition of local black cooperatives and buying clubs that would then be uh, networked and affiliated um, citywide, regionwide, statewide, and then all affiliated with the National Association. Their view was if they got 5,000 chartered members, everybody just paying a dollar, they would have $5,000 to help do co-op education and organizing. Their long-term goals were to have, um, you know, a forum uh, in every neighborhood, then cooperative enterprises were and wherever they had a co-op council, and then wholesale establishments, a co-op bank or a credit union, wherever there was a council and factories, regional factories to produce food, clothing, and shelter that would then be used in all the, um, the co-op wholesale stores. So they had big plans, which they didn't really get to achieve, but yet they spent at least four or five years really educating Blacks about cooperative economics and helping Blacks to start, especially food co-ops. They had chapters in New York, Philadelphia, Montessee, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Columbus, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. So Ohio was quite well represented. Phoenix, New Orleans, Columbia, South Carolina, Portsmouth, Virginia, Washington, DC. At their height, they had a total membership of 400. They were able to help develop co-op stores in places like Buffalo, New York, Harlem, Philadelphia, Columbia, South Carolina. They also helped to support the Cincinnati Citizens Cooperative Society Buying Club. In Cleveland, there was a newspaper distribution co-op. Um, and so you see some of the things that were accomplished. The other thing that was really interesting about this organization was how committed it was to leadership, youth leadership and women's leadership. Ella Jo Baker, as I said, you might know her from her later years in SNCC in the 50s and 60s, but she was executive director she actually gave a speech about the role of women in co-ops at their first national convention in 1931 in Pittsburgh. That conference had 600 participants. So you can see this was not some little national organization. They were serious and they got in the, right, the middle of the Great Depression, they got 600 young black folks in a room to talk about cooperatives and to listen to somebody who, like Ella Baker, who at that time had just come out of college, right, to talk about how important women's roles were in co-ops and how important co-ops were um, to the black community. So um, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll fast forward through a couple more of these. I wanted to do another rural co-op system in North Carolina. This was also in the 30s and 40s, uh, started by two black school, black education institutions, Bricks Rural Life School and the Tyrell County Training School in North Carolina. Both of them established um, co-op networks among the parents of the children that they were teaching. They did co-op education, started farmers co-ops, equipment co-ops, credit unions, buying clubs, and health insurance. And they then organized the Eastern North Carolina Association and then a larger um, statewide North Carolina Council of Black co-ops and credit unions. Um, I'll skip the details about BRICS, but BRICS developed adult education around co-op development for, as I said, the families. They had credit unions of uh, a nurse, farm equipment co-op, and a health program. Um, 
By the late 1940s, more than 75% of the families in the area where the school was had at least one member connected to a co-op. So you see what kind of a network they had developed. The Tyrell County did something similar. They had study groups on cooperative economics. They were teaching uh, their members uh, about cooperatives and how to use them. Um, they started a credit union in 1939 and 1940, a co-op store in 1941, a co-op health service program. And then as we said, uh, oh, this was the health program. I'm gonna skip that so I can get finished with this. And then they created the statewide coalition. The thing that's so important about the statewide coalition was it enabled them to create manuals and workshops to teach about how to start a credit union or a co-op to black folks and to teach it to black folks in a way that black folks could understand it. But they also were able to get the state agricultural department to support them and to put money into it so they could go around the state and do these workshops and hand out the manuals. They were so successful that in 1936, there were only three black credit unions. By 1948, there were 98 black credit unions in the state of North Carolina and also 48 other co-ops. Um, and so uh, including a housing co-op and including two of the health co-ops, that kind of thing. So you can see how important the, you know, coming together statewide, doing the education and training, right? And getting um, actual state uh, support and resources. The Southwest Alabama farmers in the 60s similarly come together, right? Their goal is to help and keep black farmers on in the region and on their land and make it um, sustainable to continue to do family farming. Uh, they were able to bring 1,800 black farmers together into the co-op. It's one of the largest co-ops in black history. Uh, they also combined with voter registration, other mutual assistance activities, and they were able to increase the members' economic security, reducing operation costs, uh, encouraging their diversification, raising their incomes by saving members money, buying in bulk, so they reduced the uh, money for fertilizer and other supplies, and also the co-op enabled them to sell their crops for higher prices, because they could sell it through the co-op, which would then um, leverage other better prices. So another example of a farm co-op and how it works. Um, that co-op was actually one of the founding members of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which continues to exist today after 54 years. It's an association of cooperative and state co-op associations throughout the South. It was started by a coalition of civil rights organizations along with grassroots activists in the South and 22 existing black co-ops at the time. And they wanted to make sure there was a regional co-op development association, which would have enough money and enough reach to help blacks again, to do similar to what um, the North Carolina group had done uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, and their plan was to address right economic independence, economic justice, not just political justice. And they, over the years, they've worked with hundreds of black and brown farmers and co-ops. They also, oops, I don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. Um, they also uh, started helping with uh, land retention. Um, and so they support sustainable farming, agricultural processing, co-op education, legal support, existing marketing co-ops, fishing co-ops, sewing, handicrafts, land buying, grocery and credit unions. Um, they protect black land ownership and merged with the Emergency Land Fund to become the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. And they also do state and federal policy, agricultural policy, especially for black farmers. So um, I think I will end there. I've got a couple. I was going to talk about black youth co-ops, but somebody can ask me a question about them. And then I want to end with that lessons learned. Sorry, Let's see if I can go back. I don't know if I can. But anyway, uh, lessons learned are how important education is, how important community, right, and organization and organizing is, um, how important the roles of making sure uh, that we write that we use that collective ownership to leverage right to leverage and to give us long term aspects to make sure that um, we understand right how to run a cooperative business that kind of thing. And so i'll end there. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't mean to go over quite so long, but I did want to give some details about some of the examples. So thank you so much.